Welcome to the Holland Market Report. It's Tuesday, July 25th. We've got a lot to share. Robert Marr joining us, our VP of Investments. Welcome, Robert. Hey, good morning, David. I hope you're well rested. I've got a lot for you today. I am well rested. Okay, yes. so let's dive right <laughs> in. Uh, first, you'll give me the opportunity to look at the numbers real quick here. Uh, one year period, of course, uh, the Dow up 11, S&P 500 up 15, and NASDAQ up almost 19%. Year to date, solid numbers as well. Dow up almost seven, S&P up 18 and a half, and the NASDAQ continuing, of course, to post those significant gains of 34%. So um, let's segue right into, with that occurring, Robert, with the NASDAQ up so much, both year over year and the year to date period, um, how does an investor know which companies are legitimately valued or, you know, on the right track and the, the price reflects, you know, really a, a fair representation of what that company is going to do versus those that are in a bubble. Right. Well, you know, that's a question that a lot of investors uh, ask themselves, and that is really um, the topic of a lot of your daytime, you know, financial news networks. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, you want to look at a few basic metrics. Um, number one, does the company have pricing power? Uh, that's very important in an inflationary environment, um, which we are still in, by the way, uh, because tomorrow the Fed is expected to hike rates and other quarter percentage point, um, but pricing power. Why is that so important? Because as prices rise, if a company, let's take Apple, for instance, if that company is able to raise the price of its flagship product like the iPhone um, and customers and consumers are still willing to pay that higher price, then that's a good company to invest in because regardless of the fact of whether they lift prices or not, consumers are gonna buy their product. That makes sense. So a company with pricing power has the ability to raise rates uh, or prices, and the, the the consumer still buys and just does a little bit of a raising of the shoulders. Okay, it is what it is. I still want the product. So there's brand loyalty, there's product loyalty, and those companies, I'm hearing you say, are positioned well in the marketplace as well as in the stock market during a an increasing inflationary period. Correct, and I might want to add one thing for our viewers is that I know we're focusing on technology companies today, but uh, pricing power also applies to value companies, your sure. Procter & Gamble's, your Johnson & Johnson's, GE. uh, GE's, you know, um, they have products, a lot of different uh, brand names that, um, again, customers are, well, you know what, you know, th this product that I, I've been buying for decades, well, I'm going to still continue to buy that product. So I'm not, we're not only talking about tech companies, but on that note, the flip side to the coin is PE ratios. Okay. I'll, I'll explain what that is. Price to earnings. Um, a lot of tech companies have very high PE multiples, which is kind of a warning sign um, because that means you're willing to pay an exorbitant price when the earnings are so small. So that's one thing that investors look at is what's a PE ratio. So for example, Tesla is sitting on a PE ratio of 77. You know, now, some of your other technology companies like Apple, Microsoft, Meta, formerly known as Facebook, they're looking in the 30s. But however, Amazon, um, their, their PE ratio is over 300. Forward PE ratio, little different, looking in the future is 81, but still higher than Tesla's. Does that mean one company's worse than the other? No, it's just one metric to look at for an investor to say, is this company in bubble territory or maybe is it a good value that I can go into? So a couple, couple things to add to that, I would say, is that when we're looking at a, a company with a high P.E. ratio, you've got, one, the fact that the, 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 the bottom part there, the earnings, their earnings are subdued because maybe they're investing a lot in a lot of expensive things that they're building the company with. So they aren't producing a lot of earnings today that could be distributed to the investor or the shareholder in the form of dividends. So that's part of that, that calculation. And then the second component, why you can see a high price to earnings ratio is because investors are looking past today and they're looking in the future and they're going, you know what? Amazon, yeah, they've got a PE ratio of 300, but that is because they're going to be the dominant uh, supplier of everything you might want with a push of a button and delivered same day by a robot. And if I might add, you know, back to the uh, pricing power, you know, how many times has uh, Amazon Prime gone up in price for its annual? Th you know what? 
me and my wife haven't noticed it. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll still, you know, if it goes up $10, $20, multiply that by hundreds of millions of people subscribe to that and you have billions of dollars of extra revenue. Well, so if we uh, dig a little deeper than Robert into the technology sector, since we've kind of kind of gone into that, um, it's up obviously quite a bit specifically this year. When can investors uh, kind of evaluate or when should they evaluate or should they? I've got like four parts to my question. Uh, in terms of, of, of evaluating whether the that particular sector is going to continue to grow and, and improve, or should they look to lock in profits? What are some of the reasons or, or ways to look at that for the investor? Look at your whole portfolio in its entirety. If you have specifically overweighted yourself in tech, and tech has been doing really well, it's never a bad idea to slim some off, take some off the top and lock in profits. At the same time, I wouldn't suggest completely getting out of stocks when you hear that the market sentiment is is going negative um, and completely get out. Because obviously, um, as this year has shown, stock prices have done very well um, in the face of what many say is the most anticipated recession of all times. Um, you know, so... One thing I want to note with that, David, is that your regular blend ETF, um, exchange traded fund or mutual fund that tracks something like the S&P 500, the technology sector is, rep and I looked at this this morning for IVV, the iShares ETF, um, that is more than 28% tech. So if you go into a fund that is well diversified, that tracks an index like the whether it be the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, S&P 500, um, you're looking at, with the in case of the S&P 500, technology is 28% of that. So you have access to technology stocks within that, that investment. So know what you own, know why you own it, and then know when to rebalance, if you will. That's what we call it in the investment community, of course, is rebalancing your portfolio. So... Um, you know, another strategy that somebody could consider is not necessarily to try to time the market in terms of what technology stocks are doing. Are they at a peak or are they just run? Are they just starting a 10 year bull market run? You, we just don't know and we can't tell you. But what we can say is that it's prudent to maintain some balance. So if we've had a strong showing with technology, it doesn't hurt to rebalance and kind of, you know, get things back in alignment because we don't, it's difficult to fly a plane when one wing is down, you want to bring it back up and, and do much better. So, and just to kind of pick up and follow up on that point, Robert, when we talk about individual stocks, how do investors in this environment of interest rates having gone up, and we can call it a, relatively speaking, a high interest rate environment versus where we were a few years ago, how should they be looking at individual companies if they want that to be part of their portfolio? Uh, very carefully, because individual companies carry something that, again, in the investment world, um, we call idiosyncratic risk, risks specific to that company. So, you know, if, if you got, if you have a winner, fantastic. But, you know, if you have a huge percentage in a single company and that company is doing well, um, then you have bragging rights with your friends. But uh, when if and when that company starts to pull back, then you're going to be underperforming, which is why we talk about diversification. It's fine to own individual stocks, um, but uh, you just have to really do your research. And I've just mentioned just a couple of dozens or hundreds of different metrics you can look at. Um, but it is very important to know that company, know where they're going, and more importantly, who are their competitors? Because their competitors may be doing a heck of a lot uh, or a heck of a better job than they are in very important areas. Yeah, and the job of professional money managers, of course, is to minimize specific company risk of blowing a hole in the portfolio uh, and having it create losses. So there is, a, I want to say it's a little bit of a bias toward mitigating or reducing risk as opposed to trying to roll the dice and bet on one company um, when you have a portfolio that you've built for either long-term growth or even looking at something that's more balanced or even more conservative. Exactly. And whatever David said um, about individual companies, also be careful about individual sectors like the technology sector. You know, it's been great for the past you know, year, six months, um, but, uh, you know, volatility affects every investment, every individual company and every individual sector. Perfectly said, Robert.
Every company is affected by risks in the marketplace. And so our key point for you today to help you plan stronger is to remain, remain balanced and disciplined in your investing. Thank you.